Well, welcome back, everyone, to a basic conversation. I have the privilege again to be sitting across from Father Basic. Father Basic, how are we doing today? We're good, Brad. Ready to go. You're ready to go. So, yep. I, I suggest we do talk about Bernard Lonergan. What that, do you think? That sounds great. Yeah. What should we start with? Well, we could just say a few words about him. Um, he was a Canadian and became a Jesuit priest. And he wrote a lot about uh, method in theology, more like how you do theology than what actually theology does or says. So he was an academic. I, I, I never met him personally. I heard him speak. And you better have your thinking cap on hmm. when you hear him speak. He was just a brilliant guy, considered one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, for sure, and an uh, exact uh, compatriot with Karl Rahner, 1904 to 1984, both of them. Hmm. And we had two giants walking the earth at the same time. Like back in the 13th century, we had St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure, both in Paris, both teaching there, two giants, theological giants, walking the earth at the same time. So we had it again, and uh, they both died then in 1984. Did they have interplay with each other? A uh, very little, which very is little. amazing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they, Rodner told me they hardly ever talk seriously the whole time they were in Rome. They did talk seriously once, and uh, it was in the United States. It was the septicentennial of the anniversary of Thomas Aquinas, and um, they were in the same room together, and they got into an argument. <laughs> And uh, about a particular aspect of theology, and Rahner said, I don't think you even know what I mean by that, and Lonergan got mad and walked out. <laughs> wow. I had a very good friend who was at that meeting. I wasn't at that session. It was after his lecture. Rahner had lectured it in Chicago. So, yeah, it's oddity, two giants, intellectuals. Mm -hmm who uh, seldom really talked or interacted and didn't do too well when they finally <laughs> they did. did. Yeah. What were some of the formative aspects of uh, Lonergan's um, development theology? Yeah. Um, well, he, he had a more philosophical mind, I think, than a theological mind. And, and he was interested in how you do theology. So th that's... I think the whole ball game. He wrote, has, wrote a major book on method in theology, and he. he let, let's be concrete about what he said. That he said that um, we're going to talk about conversion, That's right? A big, he yes. talked about conversion, yeah. and when we, when we say conversion, we often refer to our evangelical friends talk about conversion and on a certain day they handed their life over to Christ and made a difference in their life. They're often very powerful witnesses to God's work in their life. And almost always there's some follow-up. In other words, it's, there was the striking moment when Christ spoke to them directly, but then there's the period of time afterwards when they try to make sense out of that. So Ronner, I mean, Lonergan talked about conversion more as a process than a single event. And, and that opens it up to our Catholic world. So our Catholic world is not usually talking about these sharp spiritual experiences on a certain date when they turn their life over to Christ. But all of us are involved in a spiritual journey. One, one image you might use to talk about that spiritual journey is, is um, borrowed from the neoconservative theologian Michael Novak, who wrote a book called uh, uh, Ascent of the Mountain and Flight of the Dove. So that conversion process for Lion is like climbing up a mountain. And at certain times you reach a plateau. And at that plateau, you have time to, well, what do I see from here? You know, I, I, I got up higher on the mountain. I see I have a broader vision now. 
and I need to make sense out of that and uh, mine the riches of that new insight. So that's one way of thinking about a lot of and talked about conversion. He had the rules for spiritual growth, which I will, uh, he, he says we need to be attentive, mm. pay attention to our experience, note what's going on, try to keep a, your vision open to things you missed before, be attentive. Secondly, be intelligent. But what he meant by intelligence was to get insight. He liked that story in the Greek world about um, learning the displacement of water theory in the, in the baths, and the guy runs out of the bath uh, naked yelling, Eureka. I used to tell my students that. When you get the point, yell out, Eureka. And, and then it's like I see it. We have moments like that. All of us have some moments like that. Oh, I see it. Why didn't I see it before? It's clear. And so, so be intelligent and be insightful, second. Thirdly, be reasonable. That is, not every bright idea I get <laughs> turns out to be all that good. We all have a lot of bright ideas that, and, that don't look that good. So this, the third rule is be reasonable. Um, so seeking truth for Lonergan is uh, one of his key ideas is you, have, you need to keep those two things separate. In other words, you have to, you have to come up with this ins insight, but don't spread it around to the world or tell your wife about it until maybe you've checked it out a little bit, mm -hmm. till you see what it means and, and whether, whether indeed is correct or not. So we have, Lonergan often said, seeing is not knowing. In other words, right now we know that. We might see a star. Does it exist? We don't know. It might have burned out a million years ago but we see it now. Seeing is not knowing. You know, you need to judge. So that was the third. What do we have so far? Be attentive, be intelligent, be, be reasonable. reasonable. Yeah. And what, what's, the, what's, what's the next? I think the other. Um, be responsible. Responsible by acting on our valid uh, insights. On validated insight. Be responsible by acting on valid insights. And then the fifth one? Be loving. Yeah, that's often missed in the commentaries on Lonergan, but he does have that. Be loving. Yeah, so th that's how he thinks we grow, by doing those things and um, applies it in various ways. So Lonergan well understood that there are dimensions to life. You know, we are... Um, emotional creatures. We can be upset with the, our team just lost, you know. We can be ecstatic by the fact that I have the birth of a grandson. Uh, yeah. so, so, so you can begin to talk, let's put it this way, you can begin to talk about emotional conversions. So how are we going to do that? Well, first thing we have to do is we have to be attentive to our emotions. We, you know, a, a lot of people don't know what they feel, um, can't name them. I, I notice that sometimes if you are somehow out of sorts in the morning as you get up, we, what do we have to say? We got up on the wrong side of the bed. Isn't that one of the things we say? Well. Some people find that if they can name that, that it will, they can manage it. So naming emotions, uh, why, why am I out of sorts today? Well, it's because I slept fitfully and I didn't get good rest. Or I'm out of sorts today because I'm worried about a meeting I'm having with a person that I don't get along that well. At, I'm having a meeting at work. We don't get along that well. I'm anxious about it. 
And sometimes I think I could find it in my own life. If I can name it, it like becomes manageable. So in emo we have to name our emotions. And we need to distinguish emotions that are actually helpful, valid, from those that aren't. Oh, so that we might find that um, it's proper to worry about uh, the health of my grandson because he's actually got problems and is going to a doctor. So it makes sense, you know, that's reasonable. So another emotion might be uh, unreasonable. It makes, it makes no sense. Not every emotion is valid, you know. So you might be upset because a colleague at work said a, some off-putting thing, but it, it doesn't make sense to be mad about that. He didn't mean it. He likes you. He didn't mean that. You know, so we, we need to distinguish when we name our emotions because emotions are helpful. You know, to be fearful of falling as an old person then helps you to be more alert to use your cane when you go out. You know, you know that emotion of fear of falling can actually be helpful yeah. to you. And other emotions aren't helpful and we need to try to disperse them or see through it in some way or another. You know, I, I, the book that you wrote in 2021, which yeah. I have in my hand here, Conversion of the Way of Life, Advice from the Epistles, yeah. is all about what we're talking about right here. Yeah. And you, for each of these uh, segments here, you give um, reflections. Yeah. And I don't know if I did one on emotions. You didn't. That was interesting. I was going to ask you in your 1989. You know, I went back over that material myself, and I found out that my book, Contemporary Theologians, which you also have, yeah. did a much better job. Well, it had the effect of what you just talked about. Yeah. But in this 2021, you just focused on the uh, intellectual, you moral, know, and religious. And I did, yeah. I think yeah. you put some of the emotion into some I of I ended up thinking you, the, the what I wrote in Contemporary Theologians was more helpful. Anyway. So at 1989 version was a, a yeah. more comprehensive view and it yeah. captures more of life. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we're on emotional conversion, right? And right. what do we see? We need to name our emotions, yeah. distinguish the good ones from the bad ones. I think for some people, it's just a matter of being uh, able to express emotions. You know, I mean, uh, we. I think by and large, my counseling uh, has suggested that men often have more difficulty name, saying their emotions than their spouses do, right. for example. That would be very common. And uh, a wife could be very helpful in saying, you know, helping you tease out, you know, you no, know, honey, why did you say that, you know? or to helping one to, to name those emotions. Are the basic, wouldn't all the, the mental health focus of today fit into this conversion category? Yes, it does. I, I think that Lonergan gives a deeper analysis, but there's certainly all the self-help books selling um, therapists on TV. Yeah, there's certainly really a... a a desire to to grow spiritually in the secular world generally, as shown by best-selling books and so on. I feel that Lonergan, not that very many people know what he said, but that he gives a sort of a more comprehensive or deeper analysis of that to me. Yeah. What let's what when we let's do another one. Let's do the intellectual conversion. Okay. Yeah. One way of thinking about that is, and I think the book is better, um, the contemporary theologian book is, that it's a matter of seeking wisdom. Yeah, intellectual conversion is seeking wisdom. Um, one way of thinking of that is that, well, we all need to realize that uh, there are limitations in what we know. <laughs> 
Oh, and part of the beauty of life that I see that people who grow uh, intellectually is they, they see new things. You know, there's not like so much knowledge and I got 90% of it. And if I can just get the next part, then I will really be smart. Knowledge isn't like that. When we learn something new, it opens up new questions, right? Now we're learning about artificial intelligence, and so now we begin to wonder of, uh, well, how does that work, and uh, how does my iPhone help me know what artificial intelligence is? So to learn something new is not to close the box of knowledge, but to open it up. And uh, the more we know, the more we know we don't know. Uh, and th then that sets a passion. Well, I want to learn more then. I want to know more. You, you frame the intellectual uh, conversion in the terms of uh, great questions of identity, meaning, and purpose, wrestling yeah. with those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a matter of being in touch with... Um, the matters of ultimate concern. You know, there's um, the meaning and purpose, you know, right at the center of what we finally need. I mean, we're not walking around every day, what's the meaning of life, but there's got to be something behind it, something in us, something that's part of us that uh, makes a decision, is life meaningful? Or is it absurd? Now we can walk around and be taken by the absurdity, uh, the Holocaust, the gulag, the killing fields, the uh, terrible dysfunction politically in our own country. Um, and, and just, it's all, you can't make sense out of it. I, so I'm not gonna vote. I'm not going to vote because you, it's, the world's upside down. The earth, the earth is unchained from the sun, as Nietzsche said. We're floating in space. Nothing makes sense. You know, logic doesn't seem to prevail. And when I'm, I'm copping out. You know, so what um, intellectual conversion is say you can't do that. You have to stay in the ball game. Have to keep trying to under, make sense out of what's going on. Uh, we need that desperately now in political discourse yeah. in the United States, so that people don't drop out or sit on the couch on election day. You know, that we stay in in process, stay with the program, and see what we can do. So intellectual conversion, seeking wisdom. Wisdom helps us to to keep a larger perspective on things. Wisdom is, in the Bible is a very practical thing. It's how you get things done. You know, so Lana would say, well, your marriage is in trouble. You know, what you need to do is seek counseling. You know, your drinking is out of control. You need to do something. Wisdom says, I will join AA and try to realize I'm powerless over drink, and therefore I need help. Uh, I need to rely on my higher power or my sponsor in AA. So there's, a, yeah, it's working that out. The ultimate question, it seems to me, especially in the modern age, knowing so much as we do, is, um, is, is life meaningful or absurd? Is life meaningful or absurd? And uh, wisdom keeps telling it, no, despite appearances. And, and for, of course, there's always uh, the Christian outlook, which I'm jumping ahead, I realize. But for us, for Christ, is t teaches us that life is meaningful. You know, seek the truth, mm. and the truth will set you free. Sure. I love that. Seek the truth and the truth will set you free. So we're gonna, that's part of what uh, that intellectual conversion is to seek truth. I mean, you could get off on that easily. You know, we're living in a, in a truth, untruth period. Time Magazine, it's a period of untruth. People got alternate facts. Uh, 
which you can't end up dealing with. So there's a lot of practical applications of that uh, intellectual conversion. Should we pivot to the moral conversion, the third segment? Why not? Yeah, why not? Moral conversion. And you yeah. frame that as a, in, other, in, in various ways, but as a, as a change of heart. Yeah, change of heart that seeks goodness mm. and not uh, self-aggrandizement, seeks the common good and not just my own moral good. So, yeah, it's to prefer to do good rather than just take care of myself. It's the opposite of the me decade, M-E decade we had. Do your own thing. Uh, Pull your own strings. The opposite of that is to try to make the world a better place. So for intellects, we said it's seeking wisdom. For this moral commitment, it's seeking goodness, seeking the good. And a big part of that in today's world is to seek the common good, mm. not just my own particular good. And so we're looking for politicians in these days to seek the common good. What are policies that serve not just my own interests or even my own partisan interests, but what what can I do What can as a politician to seek the common good, the good that everyone shares in? And so that, that's another way of thinking about uh, it's, it's to seek virtue. You know, we have main virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, those we call the cardinal virtues. So a, a moral person seeks to be prudent, to make good judgments about complex things. You know, the moral person seeks to be temperate, you know, don't drink too much, you know, don't spend too much money. Don't get uh, too involved with someone you shouldn't be dealing with. So temperance and justice, mm-hmm. that would be a means to seek justice. Uh, justice is to give other people their due. So in our society today, you know, there's a lot of talk, well, we have to have justice for the disadvantaged. We need greater justice for the poor, the most vulnerable, the unborn. We need to have justice for them. And then, then we need the virtue of fortitude or courage to follow through when it's hard, uh, often doing good, uh, becomes a burden. I'm sick and tired of uh, apologizing to my spouse. I want him to apologize once. Okay, let him be the one who takes the, tries to be civil after we had a fight. I'm tired of taking the initiative in that all the time. So, so the, the question of justice. So it's to seek virtue. Virtue, as Thomas Aquinas says, makes things easier to do. If we have a virtue, we don't have to fight. Like if someone has the virtue of temperance, they don't have to go to a party and say, I can't have that third drink. I can't have that third drink. I got to be careful. You know, walk, walk around with water. You know, the, the person who has, has the virtue of temperance doesn't worry about it. They go to a party, and every time they go to a party, they drink reasonably. You know, they don't have to worry about it. So that, that's interesting. Thomas Aquinas thought virtues make it easy to be good or easier. Some, you know, there's a Catholic sense sometimes that the harder it is, the better it is. It's better to go to 6 o'clock Mass when you're all asleep than 11 o'clock Mass when you're awake. Harder the better. And Thomas Aquinas was very much against that. No, virtue makes it easier to be good. What about the fourth uh, dimension? And that would be a religious conversion. And just as a framing of that, you've described it as falling in love with God. Yeah, what that was great, that f- uh, fifth thing of Lonergan, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Be loving. Mm-hmm. 
falling in love with God. Mm. Yeah, people talk about that. Not everyone knows what that feels like. Not everyone recognizes that. What, what, what would it mean to fall in love with God? And yet there's many people who have said that, uh, whose uh, life has been changed because they uh, now see God as their absolute, as the one, the source. A couple of words that come to mind for a is that God is the source of all goodness in the world. All the positive things we say about God, God is the source. God is all forgiving. Our Muslim friends have a lot of names, a hundred names or more for God. God is compassion. That's something Master Eichhardt, a uh, great mystic, said that the best name for God was compassion. Others would say the best name for God is the forgiving one. For me, God is uh, the source of my uh, love for my fellow man. God is the, the energy that helps me work for social justice. Uh, so we need, uh, part of the whole thing is naming God in a way that, that speaks to us. Uh, one of the important things about all of that is that uh, to find ways to pray to God that reflect our real feelings. You know, some people will say, well, I, I don't praise God. I just, I don't feel it, I, but I'm grateful. Mm. <laughs> you know, my, I, I'm good at being grateful to God. I always say, find something that's real and go with it as a spiritual director. If gratitude is your biggest emotion, or your deepest feeling, then say a lot of prayers of gratitude. Try to extend it. I'm grateful for my job. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for my education. I'm grateful to live in the United States where I can practice my religion. Uh, I'm grateful that I got good Jewish and Muslim friends. A lot of bring gratitude if you're if that's what you're good at. Right. So the, the um, this serves as a. Uh, a template for spiritual growth yeah. and also personal development. Yeah. Would that be an accurate statement, what Lonergan is? Yes, that's good, yeah, very good, yeah. So what you, you get a feeling out of him that um, as you climb that mountain, sometimes it's a struggle. Like somebody says, I've been struggling with my gambling problem now, and I... I finally have gotten some control over it. I need to be grateful. Now what do I see about the world? Now that I'm not worried about my gambling problem, now I can be kinder to my granddaughter who needs assistance. She's graduating from college. In other words, we can redirect our energy if we see that clearly, I think. All of that, I mean, you can go back and say, well, the biggest conversion of all is to Christ, to say Christ is my absolute savior. Christ is my definitive prophet. Christ is the parable of God's goodness. Christ is the paradigm of human existence, the best human who ever lived, the most actualized, the most fulfilled, the most impactful, so that... Uh, to make Christ the center. All of those other conversions, you could put Christ at the center of. Uh, so to, to moral conversion is to live Christ's law of love of God and love of neighbor. Yeah. You know, to, Christ is the wisdom of the Father for intellectual conversion. You want to know what intellectual conversion looks like? It's to put on the mind of Christ See it his way. He's the wisdom of the Father made concrete. That's why his stories are so important. That's why we read in the Bible about uh, his cures and his his uh, the way he handled people and so on. Father Basic, do we have a summative uh, insight or anything concluding that we need to? No, but I think we did 
pretty good in, in applying. See, it's always a question of, so Bernard Lonergan's a brilliant thinker, and he's written books and so on, like Insight is his great book, and Method and Theology is his second great book. Uh, and the task is always to say, how is it practical? And I think there's some takeaways here. Well, this book that I have here, you, you put in the practical takeaways under each one of these. Like I just opened up yeah. under moral conversion, number 33, promoting economic justice. Yep. 34, overcoming racism. So th actually that material was taken from the epistles and uh, the uh, concrete examples come from the epistles and uh, that Paul wrote. Paul very often wrote things that were practical, you know. And then you put a question after each one, like what can I do to overcome racism? Yeah, read some more. <laughs> what step can I take to use my financial blessings more constructively? That's, Ooh, that's good. That's good. Uh, let's see. Following scriptural advice, which bit of advice in this passage do I most need to make spiritual progress? So I found those questions deeply uh, it was a great catalyst for it, meditation. It works for you, the yes. questions, yeah. yeah. So this book, the way uh, you framed it and laid out, I think it is uh, very practical, day, daily living, yeah. spirituality, per, spiritual, spiritual growth, personal development. So I just got an email from a young woman who uh, uh, I, I had written... Uh, a long article that sounded too political to her, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think I'll tell her we'll read my conversion <laughs> book, which doesn't sound political directly. Directly, no. But it is. Oh, I'm glad you brought up those questions. The questions are great. Yeah. I also found it interesting that you think your 1989 writing, um, including that effective emotional, yeah. was more comprehensive, better laid out than this 19. A 2021 book. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. So we're doing good work in 1989, doing good work in 2021 too, right? <laughs> Bernard Lonergan, a giant of theology, a man who put all of his effort into method and theology, and has set out patterns and principles that can guide all of us. Be attentive. Be intelligent. Be reasonable, be responsible, and be loving. Amen. Thank you, Prophet Basie.